Thank well, good afternoon, and uh, it really is a pleasure to always come back to Egypt and, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, I don't do this often, but uh, it's always great to be here, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me just start by just kind of tell you how I got into this and why this topic is relevant, and certainly to know what happens to kidney donors, it's relevant, but for me, it's a, it's a personal issue. Uh, this is... Um, a gentleman who was born in 1972 with one kidney. Family was told that he will die by age 15 from kidney failure. Uh, he's currently 46 years old, has two beautiful children. He's actually went on to become a renowned expert in spinal cord injury, and his creatinine as of last week is 0 0.9 and has no proteinuria. And this happens to be my youngest brother, so I became really interested uh, and how could someone live with one kidney? And when I was uh, in high school, I actually sent a letter to Barry Brenner uh, asking him about this, why one kidney donors develop kidney failure. And he said, well, they just don't live long enough to develop kidney failure, and that's why. So he encouraged me to go to Minnesota to work with Tom Hostetter, who's interested in hyperfiltration. And uh, it was a good opportunity because Minnesota at the time was the largest transplant center uh, uh, in the world for live donation. And that's how I got into it. And I'll try to take you through kind of the last 20 years or so, uh, discuss the risk of end-stage kidney disease and kidney donors. And in the last five years, my main area of interest, uh, can people with diabetes actually donate? Can people with hypertension donate? Uh, and is GFR, if you lose GFR with, with aging at one ml per minute per year, uh, if you donate a kidney, do you lose kidney function faster? And most importantly, I think this is uh, something uh, we could actually predict these things. We don't have to guess uh, what happens to people, I think. So this is uh, one of the earliest paper we've done. This is uh, back in 2009 now where we looked at 4,000 people who donated between 1963 and 2007. I would just ask two simple questions. Uh, do kidney donors live as long as someone who hasn't donated a kidney? And we certainly, you know, I can't tell you whether they actually live the same or longer, but at least compared to the general population who are not as healthy as kidney donors, it does appear kidney donors may live a year to two uh, longer. Uh, but this, I think, has set the stage and generated a lot of interest. Prior to this paper, there, there really wasn't much about the outcomes of uh, kidney donors. Then I think something, uh, so that was in 2009, and I think uh, two important papers came, most of you are familiar with. This is from Holdas' group in Norway. Uh, Norway has been doing transplants since 1963. What's really interesting about Norway, all their transplants happen in one hospital. So no matter where you are in Norway, you have to go to this one hospital. So it's a very unique system. Uh, well, what they found, they had 2,000 donors. Nine out of the 2,000 uh, developed kidney failure after 15 years. So if you put it together, that's 0.47%. So 99.5% of their donors, nothing happens to them. Look at the mean age of kidney failure is 64, which is identical to people with two kidneys. But this is the, the two most interesting things. One is that seven out of the nine develop kidney failure from immune diseases such as lupus or Wagner's granulomatosis. Well, these, these conditions would affect you whether you have one or two kidneys. They have nothing to do with kidney donation. But importantly, all of them were blood relative to the recipient. Well, if you have kidney failure in your family, whether you have one or two kidneys, you're actually seven times more likely to develop kidney failure. So how to really tell whether the, the development of kidney failure is due to donation versus uh, family history is, uh, is difficult, and I'll try to answer it for you the best I can. This is a paper from uh, one of my good friends, Dory Sega, uh, where they look at uh, United States donor, roughly 100,000 people, and they just wanted to ask the question, in contrast to the papers I've showed you earlier, we compared kidney donors to the general population. What this paper tried to do 
is to compare kidney donors to someone who's as healthy as a kidney donor but doesn't donate. So I think it's a, it's a better uh, paper, except if you look here, we went back to 1963, they could only go back to 94, which is really not long-term follow-up. So this is a slide I put with Dory a few, uh, few months ago. And if you take all this data combined, combine, everything that's been published in the world uh, on uh, what is the incidence of kidney failure and kidney donors, you can see it by group. Uh, at 20 years, it's around half a percent. Females, males more than females, black more than non-black. And certainly if you're uh, related, uh, it's higher more than unrelated kidney donors. But you can see, no matter where you look in this table, uh, you almost never see a risk that is higher than 1% uh, other than uh, African Americans. So the most one could say about the risk of kidney failure is that 99.5% of the time, it will not happen. Now, if you want to kind of look into this in more details and see, ask, well, who develops kidney failure? Uh, I think one interesting question is if you want to take these people who develop kidney failure, I think the first question you want to see whether the cause of the kidney failure in the donor is the same as the recipient, because if they have the same family history. So this is a paper I forgot from a couple of years ago. And what we found is that only 25% of donors will have the same reason for kidney failure as the recipient. 75% of the time, they develop kidney disease that is uh, different than uh, the recipient. But this is the interesting thing. Those people, kidney donors who developed kidney failure earlier, it was almost always due to FSGS or glomerular disease. Those who developed kidney failure in a later stage, it was always hypertension and diabetes. So I think that this is the group I think that one has to think about more often uh, is people donating to family members with FSGS or glomerular disease. But certainly the biggest group is above 65 and it's from diabetes and hypertension, which is similar to what you see in the general population. Then we wanted to look to see uh, what is the course of kidney failure and this is not the greatest slide, but each line is a, an individual donor. And you can see this is up to 40 years after donation. And each line is a kidney donor's kidney function or GFR over time. And you can see almost always they have nice steady kidney function, then they have a drug. In 95% of kidney donors, there was always an acute event that actually caused the kidney failure. They had cabbage and they had acute kidney injury. Uh, they had sepsis, had hip replacement and had sepsis. Not a single case showed kind of progressive decline in kidney function. There was always an acute uh, event, which I think is, is important because kidney donors are not protected from acute kidney injury, similar to people with two kidneys. Now the next question is, well, is it possible that you lose more kidney function if you have one kidney versus two kidneys with aging? And these studies, we actually measured glomerular filtration rate, so it's not estimated, it's not creatinine-based. Oh, you can see uh, these are uh, donors who uh, had multiple GFR measurements, and you can see this line. And if you take the slope, it turns out kidney donors lose half an ml or 0.4 ml per minute per year. In contrast to you and me, with two kidneys, we actually lose roughly one ml per minute per year. So people with one kidney do not seem to lose more kidney function uh, with aging. As I showed you earlier, uh, there's no question that uh, kidney donors who are related to the recipient are more likely to develop kidney failure. So we asked a, a different question. Well, if this is true, that would mean uh, living related donors would have a change in GFR that is faster than unrelated donors. And we couldn't see a difference. And this is the really interesting thing. Look at GFR changes. We, we saw GFR changes uh, keep going up uh, actually till age 70. 
it's after 870 when we start seeing GFR going down. So not only you don't lose kidney function as quickly as people with two kidneys, in fact, look at this. I mean, everybody's kidney function. The hyperfiltration, which kind of you teach medical students, it just happens in the first year after donation. This is not true. GFR continues uh, to go up for many years after donation. So I think I'm just going to start with uh, maybe a question. How many people would accept somebody with diabetes to donate? <coughs> Nobody. How many people would accept somebody with impaired fasting glucose to donate? <coughs> How many people would accept people with hypertension to donate? How many people say absolutely never? No? Well, I think that to answer this question, it's not an easy question, and I certainly, uh, I'm hoping we're getting closer to the answer. Uh, I think the concern is this, is that if you donate a kidney, uh, you have hyperfiltration, right? Well, if you have diabetes, you have hyperfiltration. And if you, if you add the two together, you'll, you'll have a worse kidney function. So this is kind of a myth. Uh, I think, you know, Barry Brenner propagated this and people believed it. So we wanted to test this really more carefully. So what is a, a better population to study this, whether this is true or not, by taking kidney donors who've donated in the past and after donation they develop diabetes. So they have the two conditions of hyperfiltration and see how they do. So, and what you see here, this is some 270 kidney donors and this is years from donation. And there was no difference in GFR decline between kidney donors who developed diabetes versus kidney donors who did not develop diabetes. More importantly, the rate of GFR change, if you have one kidney, was similar to people with two kidneys. Why is that? Well, I think it's very simple, actually. The hyperfiltration from reduction in renal mass uh, is not due to rise in intraglomerular pressure. It's actually the glomerular surface area increases. While in diabetes, it's the rise in the intraglomerular pressure. So they actually don't add up. Uh, but I think this is really, it, people are just convinced that hyperfiltration is bad. And if you're interested in this, there's a paper in C. Jason last year uh, showing that even in type 1 diabetics from the DCCT trial, Hyperfiltration has absolutely no implications on long-term kidney function. I think it needs to go away because I think it just uh, made things worse. But let me prove this to you in a little better way. So the definition of diabetes has changed over the years. So glucose of 126 actually is recent, is I think 2007, which means if you donated in the 60s, or 70s, or 80s, or 90s, uh, you are accepted if you had a blood uh, sugar 140. Why? Because that was normal at the time, right? But by today's standards, it's diabetes. So what, what, I, what I wanted to do is actually go back to the last 50 years of kidney donation and see kind of what the outcome of kidney donors based on their glucose at donation I think it would educate us who have, um, you could have discussions with the family with impaired fasting, glucose, or diabetes. And I think it's, it's the greatest experiment to study whether hyperfiltration is actually bad for you because it's just diabetes and single kidney. There is no comorbid conditions. So let me show you how we did this. Uh, so between uh, 63 and 2007, uh, I've been following 9,000 donors from the Mayo Clinic, Alabama, and uh, my old hospital in Minnesota. And 6,000 of them had a glucose less than 100. Uh, 1,800 between 100 and 125. So this group in the middle is the impaired fasting glucose, which some of you said they wouldn't accept them. Uh, and this is the interesting group. Uh, there has been 250 kidney donors who donated at a time they were they had diabetes by today's standards. So, so this is not a prospective study where we randomized people. We just went back in time and uh, looked what happened to them. 
And you can see, so the group in, in red kind of came from the earlier years, 74 to 83. Uh, so most of the impaired fasting glucose kind of came from the earlier years. Let me show you what, the impaired, what their blood sugar in these 250 people. Some of them donated uh, with a blood sugar of 205, 155. Those are people today, they walk into your clinic, you cancel everything and tell them to go home. They can't do it, correct? That's kind of... Um, so this is what they look like. Again, there was 250 diabetics, 1,800 with impaired fasting glucose. And you can see the age of donation is similar, 39, 42, et cetera. 90% uh, or so were white. Their BMI, 25, 27, uh, 26. Uh, the majority were related uh, to the recipient. And this is their GFR was 89 miles per minute. So, you know, kind of typical kidney donor uh, features. And this is what we looked at, mortality, hypertension, diabetes development, proteinuria, GFR less than 30, or end-stage kidney failure. Well, the group that donated when they had diabetes had a higher mortality, which is not different than any diabetic. If you're diabetic with one or two kidneys, you have higher mortality, and it was not different than the general population. Proteinuria was not different, whether you donated at a time you were diabetic. Hypertension was not different and end-stage kidney disease was not different. Let me show you the actual numbers. Uh, this paper is currently in, in press, but um, I'm gonna give you, if you look at this column and uh, row down here, so end-stage kidney disease, remember, in the, impaired, in the diabetes group, there was 250 people. Out of the 250 people, three individuals developed end-stage kidney disease after uh, 20 years after donation. So, if you take a thousand diabetics and you follow them up to 40 years, you will get 12 cases of kidney failure, which is not too bad actually. If you think 12 out of a thousand, that's 1.2 percent. So I think that the numbers are really uh, encouraging. So, well, the bigger question is. I showed you only three out of 250 over a 40 year period with diabetes developed kidney failure. The question, is that different than somebody with two kidneys? And this is end stage kidney disease uh, uh, incidence in, in kidney donors versus uh, type two diabetics in the general population and there was no difference. So if you have one kidney and you develop diabetes, your chances of kidney failure are not different than somebody with two kidneys. And think about it, this is, this may surprise you, but think about this. Do you ever see diabetic nephropathy cause end-stage kidney disease in a kidney transplant recipient? How many people have seen it? We transplant a lot of diabetics, right? And one kidney, we almost never see diabetes. Of course, people say, well, they don't live long enough, but that's probably not true. I mean, People who've been doing this for 20 years should at least see a case or two in their lifetime. We don't see this. So it's not surprising that one kidney and diabetes are now worse than uh, diabetes and two kidneys. I'm just going to move to hypertension. This is a, a paper from a, last year or a couple of years ago. We just wanted to look at hypertension after donation. Uh, and what we found actually that kidney donors are less likely to develop hypertension than general population controls. I have to say, since then, there's a paper by the Hopkins group that showed that hypertension might actually be higher in kidney donors, but our results were different. So I'm just going to stop here for one second. So how many people believe hypertension causes chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease? Don't be shy. That's it? I think everybody believes it. But <laughs> Sounds like a tricky question, but everybody believes it, right? Well, let's talk about this, because I think it's, it's really important how we practice medicine. So what was the definition of hypertension in the 60s and 80s? It was more than 160 over 100, then came down to 150, came down to 140, and now it's down 130. Next year, probably be 100, who knows? 
So donors with this level of blood pressure were normal tensive by the standard of the time, but now they're considered hypertensive. Again, similar to what I showed you with the diabetics. Mm -hmm. You know, they took them in the past because they were considered normal, and we took a lot of hypertensives at the time because that was the normal. But let me just go kind of discuss this with you. So does hypertension really cause ESRD? I'm just going to start with this, with this paper because uh, it's uh, an important one. And I, I hope everybody, uh, if you have a chance, I'd like you to read this. Nearly 30% of Americans initiating renal replacement therapy received this nonspecific diagnosis that in the States, 50% of ESRD is from diabetes and 30% from hypertension. This is what we teach everyone, not me, but suggesting that essential hypertension does not cause ESRD would seem laughable today. Actually, you tell a nephrologist that hypertension doesn't cause end-stage kidney disease, I think they want to kill you, basically. But, you know, they, they're polite. Nephrologists are polite most of the time, uh, so they don't do that. Uh, again, please don't, uh, there's no question if you have chronic kidney disease and you have uh, poor blood pressure, it will make your kidney disease go down faster. We're not, this is not what we're discussing. If you just have hypertension, does it take you to kidney disease? So that's the difference. It's not about progression of kidney disease. I think this is the paper, I think, that um, did this feel uh, almost a disservice. His, but let me take you through. This is looking at over a million people uh, in San Francisco in the Kaiser Permanente system. Uh, everybody had a GFR of 80, 60 or better. They had dip negative, a dipstick negative proteinuria. And they just followed these people, and they had hypertension, and they followed them for, um, for a long time. But let me show you what, what it actually, this is the paper people quote as hypertension causing end stage kidney disease. Look at this, how many cases of kidney failure, 1,100 out of 8.2 million patient years. I'll do the math for you so you don't have to, to have a, get a headache from doing this. So basically it's 0.01% chance. That's what it is. But th this is what people don't kind of think about, and I've been thinking about this for a little bit now, Maybe the link between hypertension and kidney failure has nothing to do with kidney failure. I think what happens is that with better hypertension control, you're less likely to die from cardiac disease. You're less likely to have strokes, so you live longer. And the time exposure becomes the problem. It's not because it causes kidney disease. If this doesn't convince you, uh, this is a meta-analysis. Interestingly, this meta-analysis comes from the same author of the paper I just showed you, who's a good friend. He's a chief of nephrology at UCSF. And basically it asks, does non treatment of non-malignant hypertension uh, preserve kidney function? And the answer is no. So this line here, if these things cross, that means not a single clinical trial has shown that if you treat hypertension, you prevent kidney disease. If anyone can think of one, just let me know. Because, uh, but this is the SPRINT trial, right? Everybody loves SPRINT. Uh, this is, we spend $75 million in this. Uh, so the, remember, this is 9,000 people. Systolic blood pressure, 120 versus 140. Uh, and the trial was stopped because there's 23% reduction in cardiac stuff. But how many people, what happened to kidney disease? Well, if you went, now if you believe hypertension causes kidney disease, well, it makes sense then treating hypertension should result in less kidney disease. But actually what happened in Sprint was the opposite. Incidence CKD occurred in 3.7% of participants in the intensive group and only 1% in the standard group. So if you had lower blood pressure, you actually suffer as more intensive. Not only this, if you remember in, uh, in spring, there was more acute kidney injury. So even from randomized trial, it doesn't seem to be true. Well, how about this? How many times do you see patients coming in for a transplant and you don't know what's causing the kidney disease? And you say, well, it's hypertensive nephrosclerosis. How many people have done that? Say, oh, it's hypertension. This is a really... A great paper. Uh, most people do know this paper. It's an old one. 
It's almost 26 years. I can't believe this. But anyway, uh, so this is, this is the, from the University of Alabama in Birmingham, where they had 45 patients coming in for a transplant, and the diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, was hypertensive nephrosclerosis. They biopsied all of them. Guess how many of them had hypertensive changes on the biopsy? Zero. Zero. This is a paper from a group in Spain. When you do the same, 50 to 75% had FSGS, IgA nephropathy. In fact, in this series, not a single patient, less than 5% of patients had hypertension documented at any time with normal breathing function. So we just don't know. We just really don't know when the kidney function declines. So uh, it's most likely that the CKD is just has not become apparent, and that's what's driving hypertension. This is a famous paper now by Morgan Graham from Hopkins. Look at the look at the risk of hypertension. This is based on a million people. Look at the lifetime risk of hypertension. Just take any group you want. In white men, look at this. You never exceeds 0.3 percent. So 99.7 percent of long-term hypertensive never develop hypertension. Again, please don't confuse this with if you have kidney disease. If you have kidney disease, hypertension is really bad for you. But if you have hypertension, does it lead to CKD? I think that's not uh, very clear. I'm just going to show you kind of similar to the diabetes one. We found a thousand donors who actually were taking blood pressure medications or had a systolic more than 140 or diastolic more than 90, and we followed them over time. And there was absolutely no difference in kidney failure, in proteinuria. Out of the 1,000 donors, there were three cases of kidney failure over 40 years of follow-up. Uh, this is, just shows you the multiple regression. Again, three cases uh, out of 1,000. So it doesn't appear to really make a difference. Um, now, a lot of programs, I don't know if it's similar to your programs here, say they would, we would take hypertensive donors if their blood, if they're above age 50. How many people do, do that? Yeah, it's common in the U.S. too. If you're above 50, we'll take you. I used to think that's good till I got to 50. I was like, 50 is not old. But, but look at this. This is, uh, of these 1,000 people, actually 60% uh, of them were less than age 50. We actually, 171 were less than age 35 and donated with hypertension and never developed kidney failure. So I'm not sure the age makes sense, you know, whether you want to factor in if they're African American. There were 90 African Americans with hypertensive. We didn't see a single case of kidney failure. But let me show, end with this uh, two slides. I think my time is up. But how could you put all this information? I didn't show you all the stuff we published. But if you take, if you're sitting with a kidney donor, age 40, male, non-smoker, GFR is this, how could you tell them what the risk is? Uh, this is actually uh, published this in Jason, I think, 2016. And if you go to the appendix, it gives you this. You could put in your patient information, and it gives you five up to 40-year risk of proteinuria, hypertension, kidney failure. This, this illustration shows you different BMI. So at BMI 20, what the risk is, if your BMI goes to 25 to 30. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really, it helps you uh, make decisions with that. So this is kind of where I come to uh, at this point is, this is these are the facts. 99% of kidney donors will never ever develop kidney failure. Those are facts. The second, which is, I didn't show you the quality of life data we published many times, 99% uh, of kidney donors say they would do it again. There's 1% actually that regrets kidney donation. Uh, I think the hypertensives can certainly donate. Obviously, you have to make sure they don't have end organ damage, they don't have LVH, obviously no proteinuria. Uh, Pre-diabetics, I think there's no reason whatsoever for them not to donate. Now, the donors with di diabetes, I think they should be considered. You know, if you're 55 or 60, you have a glucose A1C of 6.7, you take good care of yourself, you're not overweight, why can't you donate? Can we go back to the slide? 
one minute. Uh, but I think if, if you're diabetic and you're 20, you probably would never consider that. So I, I do think we need to change our practices. I think there's a lot of convictions in medicine that may not be found, and we keep propagating them. And I think hopefully with uh, more data, we'll be able to clarify some of this. But I think the hypertensive can safely donate if there's no end organ damage. I think the impaired fasting glucose, I don't even do glucose tolerance on them. The diabetics, uh, it's illegal in the United States to take diabetics, so nobody's ever done it. But what I showed you is something that was done in the past. Uh, but I certainly, this is one of the reason I moved to Osama Gaber's place, because we're really interested in uh, pushing this. Can I advance it? I just want to finish with two slides. One, uh, this is uh, somebody, Osama and I did uh, last May. This is the oldest live kidney donor in the world. Uh, he was 85 years old. And he donated to his neighbor, uh, who was uh, 74. Uh, so I actually like older donors. I don't like younger donors. Because if you're 60 to 70 and healthy, What's going to happen to you? you do, but a 20 year old, you have to live with one kidney for 80 years. Uh, can we advance this one more time, please? So maybe there's some good in him. Anybody knows who I'm talking about? Anybody wants to guess? If I could, this man. <laughs> so actually, there is some good in him, believe it or not. So uh, President Trump actually signed uh, the most uh, incredible uh, kidney-friendly executive order this past July. It's actually the best thing that happens to kidney disease. I think it's going to change. It's a revolutionary in what it's going to do to kidney disease. Uh, he wants the number of transplants to double in the next five years. Uh, he wants... 80% uh, of dialysis patients to actually dialyze at home. And if you don't start your patients, <laughs> is it the Trump picture? <laughs> One minute. Yes, ma'am. And I think the, the most important thing that he, he did is that imagine if you want to donate to your brother and, you know, you have a job and, you know, they don't reimburse you for the time you're taking away. Actually, the government now under this law will pay you your salary while uh, you're recovering. Uh, and the last thing, this is a nephrologist like this. If you have a chronic kidney disease stage 5 patients in the U.S. beginning January 2020, and you help the patient actually goes to transplantation without ever going to dialysis, the nephrologist will get $15,000 if you could avoid, uh, which is much cheaper than dialysis. With that, I'll stop and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.